This morning, I'd like to ask you to think of the last time that you saw a show or a movie or maybe read a book that had a very complex storyline. You know, we as human beings, we love, we love stories, we love novels, we love movies. And you know, uh, some of those stories are more complex than others. Some of them are a bit more difficult to follow than others. Uh, there's some stories where there's a lot going on and you can't quite track with everything. But in the end, there's always this big, amazing resolution. It's quite, it's quite something when you can see how things weave through and then uh, come in uh, all, all right in the end. And oftentimes, if we were to rewatch these movies or reread these books, what happens is that you catch things in the uh, second time around, isn't, don't you? You catch things that you didn't notice the first time. And oftentimes, you catch, and oftentimes the reason that you catch these things is because you know how the story ends. You've already read the ending. So when you experience the story again, it's more obvious to you when something happens that will be of significance later because you've already seen how it was significant later. You know, this is part of good storytelling when there are little clues and hints along the way that seem insignificant until you get to the resolution of them, right? I think you all know what I'm talking about. Okay, now I want you to think of a kaleidoscope. I think you all know what a kaleidoscope is. It's one of those toys, kind of looks like the pirate spyglass, and you spin it, and there's those little shapes inside, and they're colors, and as you spin it, they, the colors change, the shapes change, and yeah, a kaleidoscope. Uh, so get, get those two pictures in your mind, and why am I bringing these up? Well, a complex story that we've already read and a kaleidoscope both in their own way help us understand the passage that we are going to be looking at this morning. Because this morning we are going to be looking at a passage that for followers of Jesus is familiar. It's both familiar like a book we've already read or a movie we've already seen, but it's also kind of topsy-turvy. It's kind of inside and out and, all, and it kind of goes in and around itself, kind of like if we were looking at it through a kaleidoscope. The passage for that we're reading this morning is poetry. You know, much of the Bible is poetry. And poetry, by nature, does not conform to linear and systematic organization. But its ability to, communi to communicate truth is every bit as powerful as something that is more linear and systematized. But our passage this morning is also a third thing. And that is, is that it is one of the battleground passages that ignites endless debate between Jews and Christians. Because, as you might know, what we call our Old Testament as Christians is also the entire scriptures for the Jews. When we are looking at a passage in the Old Testament that to us seems like it points very clearly to Jesus, such as our passage today, we are taking a side in a debate that has been going on now for thousands of years. Jewish people back in the days of Jesus, Jesus, as well as today, have always had difficulty accept, accepting Jesus as the one God sent to fulfill all the promises that were made in the scriptures. Jews take their relationship with God just as seriously as Christians do, and they see the Bible as being the unique and inspired word of God, just like Christians do, and they believe that God is not a trickster or false in his ways. But instead, they believe that he is just and faithful to fulfill his promises. But, unfortunately, in their earnest pursuit of knowing the truths of God and knowing the promises of God, they just don't have a place for a Messiah that looks like Jesus. The Jews of Jesus' day expected God to send someone who would free them from their bondage to the Romans. Instead, God sent Jesus to free humanity from its bondage to sin and death. The Jewish leaders, in their one-sided focus on earthly problems, forgot about their spiritual problems. In their desire to be set free, they forgot what their freedom was ultimately for. See, God gave them their freedom so that they could be a holy nation before him. And being a holy nation means that they needed to be righteous, or in other words, that they needed to be in the right before God. And how do you get to be in the right before God? Well, your sin has to be removed, and you need to be cleansed. 
Now, if you were an ancient Israelite, this would normally happen through the various rites and rituals of the sacrificial system. But the sacrificial system of ancient Israel wasn't perfect because its effectiveness relied on the reliability of humans. And if there's one thing that humans are good at, it's failing in our task to remain reliable. So if humanity was ever going to have a chance to be permanently righteous before God, like Adam and Eve were before the fall, there, need, there needed to be a more permanent solution to the problem. And the sacrificial system that the Jews practiced was never going to produce a permanent solution. Our passage today, through its topsy-turvy twisting and winding, tells the story of one who came to be the permanent solution, who came to faithfully do the things that we could never do and be the things that we could never be. It tells of one who gave his life so that we could be in the right before God, who bore our sins and cleansed us with his blood. And if this sounds like Jesus to you, that's just because you already know how this story ends. So let's read this passage now. It's Isaiah 53, uh, 52, verse 13. And we'll be reading through chapter 53, verse 12. Isaiah 52, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils among the strong." Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many, many and made intercession for the transgressors. You know, this really is one of those passages that it doesn't take much explanation, does it? Uh, for those of us who are familiar with the story of Jesus, the, the similarities just leap off the page. And my job of helping you all understand how this passage points to Jesus in this case is actually quite easy, isn't it? It's so easy, in fact, that it seems to me that there's really only one of two possible scenarios for how we got such similarities between our passage today and the life of Jesus as it's recorded in the Gospels. I think that either one, Jesus is the true fulfillment of this passage, or two, the writers of the Gospels just made up stories about Jesus and based those stories on this passage that we read here. That's just how similar these two things are. I don't know how else you can get this number of similarities. But while the similarities between the actions of the servant and the life of Jesus are readily apparent, 
what can take a bit of work is figuring out what is this passage actually saying. As I said in the introduction, our passage today is poetry, and poetry by nature often makes you work a little bit to find the truth that it is communicating. But in the most basic and simplest terms, this passage is talking about God's righteous servant who, in his wisdom and knowledge, was willing and able to accomplish and fulfill God's will and task for him. And that task was an incredibly difficult one. Indeed, it was the most difficult thing a human being has ever done. The servant was to allow himself the servant was to allow himself to be broken and cut off so that by his sacrifice others could be justified. We see this in verse 11 where it says by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And you know honestly how is that? How is it that the suffering and death of the servant somehow leads to others being justified? Well, in order to answer that, we first need to know what it means to be justified. Now, this term justified is one of those Christian terms that we typically don't use in our everyday language. I think for most of us, we really only hear the word justified in, well, like a sermon, like right now. Like right now is typically when you hear the word justified. And you probably have a general sense of what the word means. It's pretty simple. It's a legal term that means that you are in the right. Or to use another word that you really only hear in church again, it's to mean to be justified means that you are righteous. Those are words that we are familiar with. And an easy way to think of justification is like if you think of, say, a mother's intuition and how her intuition was justified when she caught her child red-handed trying to sneak some cookies before dinner. Like she had a righteous intuition. It was in the right. Or to use an example from my own life, you know, over the last few years, I've been accumulating a collection of cordless Makita power tools. And as you might know, these tools, and especially the batteries that power them, they are not cheap. And these aren't items that you purchase on a whim. They are the kind of thing that you only buy if you have a justifiable reason to buy them. And you would be surprised at how creative I can get when I'm trying to convince myself that I want to buy one and how easily I can justify my purchase of them. So over the years, I purchased some items that <clears throat> ended up not being used all that much, but my justification for it was that they were the kinds of items that you really wanted to have on hand when you needed them. They were the kind of thing you didn't want to be caught without. I think some of you probably know what I'm saying. And all this culminated when the moving truck that I had ordered that was going to take us here from Abbotsford ended up not being available, and our only solution to the problem was to use a smaller truck and a little trailer that I happened to have. You guys have seen this trailer. The only problem was that at the time, the trailer, <clears throat> the trailer didn't have a deck or any kinds of sides on it, so right at the time, it was unusable. So my dad, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, and myself all put the trailer together all in a couple of hours, and we were only able to do that because I already had the tools on hand. My purchase of those tools was justified, and I was very proud of myself for it. So that's kind of an idea of what justified means. It means to, in the end, be in the right. So we go back to our question of how is it that the suffering and death of the servant in Isaiah leads to others being justified? How is it that the good actions of one person can offset the evil actions of another person? Because typically in our normal everyday life, the good conduct of one person does not justify the evil actions of another person. We are justified by our own actions. You know, if someone is a murderer, it doesn't matter if they have a brother who is a loving and faithful husband and father. The good actions of the one do not in any way justify the actions of the other. You can't be justified through the actions of other people. But in our passage this morning... That is what we have. The servant will cause others to be justified. How does this happen? Well, let's think. In what other context can someone be justified or be made right before God through the actions of someone else or something else? We've already talked about it. The sacrifices, the offerings, the sacrificial system, the system designed to make people right before God through the giving of an animal's life and the sprinkling of its blood. You know, that's how you get to be justified through, the, through a third party. 
We can read about this in the Day of Atonement ceremony in Leviticus 16. That's where we read how once a year the high priest was to take a bull and two goats and use the blood of the bull and one of the goats to cleanse the tabernacle from any impurities. See, in the Old Testament, humans, just by living their lives, got dirty. They got impure. They became unclean. And they also spread the uncleanness. And because humans go into the tabernacle, uncleanness might have gone into the tabernacle. Because where humans go, uncleanness can follow. Now, you might think that being unclean means that you have sinned, but there's actually a distinction made between sinfulness and uncleanness in the Old Testament. And this distinction is most apparent in the Day of Atonement ceremony itself. See, on that day, the high priest was to take, again, a bull and two goats and use the blood of the bull to, to cleanse the tabernacle, that were, to cleanse any of the items in the tabernacle that may have been made dirty, from just being around him, the high priest. The bull was to cleanse the tabernacle for the high priest. And then he was to do the same with one of the goats, and the blood of one of the goats was to cleanse the tabernacle from being exposed to the uncleanliness of the Israelites. So a bull for the high priest, one goat for the Israelites. That was the system. This had nothing to do with human sinfulness. That is dealt with in another way. Being unclean simply means that you encounter and deal with the brokenness and decay of the world. That's what it meant to be unclean in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean you sinned. It means that you had a skin disease. It means that you buried your passed away father. Like That's what being unclean meant. So in the, in the Old Testament, experiencing the brokenness and, and decay of the world is not considered sin. It's just considered being unclean. And anything that is unclean, though, has no place in the holy sanctuary of God. It's not that it can't be there because it's sinful. It's because God is so holy and pure that anything unclean and impure can't be there. And we live our, li- and we live our lives this way too. Uh, there are places in our homes that we reserve for special cleanliness uh, where the dirtiness of life doesn't have a place, just like the dirtiness of life doesn't have a place in God's sanctuary. Uh, think, of, uh, think of your... Uh, kitchen. Think of the counter in your kitchen. You know, it's not a sinful thing for me to be outside working in the yard and to get my shoes dirty. You know, that's not a sinful thing. However, would it be okay for me to then take my dirty shoes off, carry them into the kitchen, and set them on the cutting board on my, in my wife's counter? No. My dirty shoes do not belong on the cutting board. They are not sinful, but they don't belong there. In the same way, the dirtiness of people does not belong in God's holy sanctuary. It's not sinful. They just don't belong there. God's sanctuary is a special place reserved for a special purpose. And because God invites humans to come in and be close to him in his special place, inevitably the holy space of God will become dirty from us. So once a year, again, the high priest used the blood of the bull and the goat to cleanse God's holy special place by sprinkling the blood on holy objects. So then what about sin? How is sin dealt with, if it's not dealt with in that way? Well, remember I said that the high priest needs two goats in the atonement ceremony. And one is sacrificed for the use of its blood, but what about the other one? Well, the other one is called the scapegoat. You've probably heard of the scapegoat. And the role of the scapegoat is that it was to carry the sins of the people out into the wilderness, away from them, never to return. This happened through a ceremony in which the high priest put his hands on the goat's head and confessed over the goat the sins of the people. And then he drove the goat away far enough so that it couldn't make its way back because the goat carried the sins and you want your sins gone. You want your sins out of here. So one goat in its life bore the sins of the people, carried them away, and was cut off from ever coming back. And the other goat in its death cleanse the holy spaces, making them clean once again after their exposure to the dirtiness and decay of humanity. So can you see the problem with this system? This system? What's the problem with this? Why, why is this system less than ideal? It's because this system is set up to deal with the effects of the fallenness of humanity, but it will never be, bring a cure for the fallenness of humanity. You know, if your roof has a leak but you want to keep your floor dry, sure, you can keep a bucket on hand and catch the water, and yes, your floor will stay dry, but the leak itself is what needs to be fixed. 
The root problem is where the attention should be. And for humanity, our root problem is that we ourselves are broken and sinful. We need to be cured. We need to be cleansed. We need to have our sins taken away, and we need a new nature that does not sin. And while it is a great thing to be, and while it is a great thing to be able to, as it were, clean up after ourselves and send away our sin, you know, that is very helpful. That doesn't help solve the problem of our sinful nature any more than catching water in a bucket helps solve a leaky roof. So then enter the servant, who, even though he did no wrong, he willingly allowed wrong to be done to him. Even though he did no sin, he allowed the sin of others to be placed on him. Even though he was right before God, he was cut off from God and driven away by man to the place of the wicked and the dead. Even though he died as an offering for sin, he will live to be exalted on high. And through his perfect sacrifice, we ourselves can experience the cure for our brokenness because he himself not only bore our sin and took it away, he overcame our sin so that in him sin itself is destroyed. And he doesn't just cleanse God's space so that it can remain pure and holy. He cleanses us. That was the role of the serpent. He cleanses us so that we are pure and holy. You know, the amazing grace of the Old Testament is that God came to live on earth and be close to his people, even though that meant being exposed to the dirtiness and decay of humanity. That really was an amazing grace that God showed the people, to want to come and be close to him, even though, peop- even though the people were not as pure and holy as he was. But the amazing grace of Jesus is that he came to live in and experience the totality of human wickedness, sinfulness, and decay, so that by his perfect sacrifice, we can become holy like he is. And if we are holy like him, we no longer need to clean up after ourselves. We are clean. We are fit to be where God is. Our sin and the effects of it is taken away, and we ourselves, because of Jesus, can live where God is without having to do the sacrificial system. That's what Jesus did. That's what he accomplished. We ourselves, the church, we are now God's dwelling place. And through the healing and cleansing power of Jesus, the holiness and purity that God requires for his dwelling place exists here in us. Because of Jesus, we are not only fit to be close to God, we are fit to have God come and dwell in us. We are righteous. We are justified. We are the temple of God. That is our reality. That is what Jesus came to do for us. And how often do we live our lives according to this reality? How often do we stop to think of just how amazing it is that the all-powerful and perfectly holy creator of the universe would go to such lengths to make us fit to be, to be his dwelling place? Not only fit to be in his dwelling place, we are fit to be his dwelling place. And all that work and all that bloodshed that was uh, done in the Old Testament just to get close to God has now been attributed to us, and we just by being in Jesus are the ones who God can be close to. You know, Jesus didn't have to do that. God is completely self-sufficient. God doesn't need us for anything. He did it because he loves us. He loves us with a perfect love that would rather let the brokenness and decay of humanity be placed on him so that he could take it away forever. And what does he ask of us in return? He asks that we be faithful to him. He asks that we give our loyalty to him above everything else. He asks that we don't keep this wonderful truth to ourselves, because, but, um, but that we should share it with those around us. And he asks that we learn from the love that he showed us and show to others. And you know, like, I struggle to put into words just how far God humbled himself to do what he did. You know, uh, so that we could be his children. Like, it really, is, it really is an amazing grace. That song says it well. You know, our God is so good and gracious to us that he would be so loyal to us. And it is my prayer, I pray that all of us show that same loyalty back to him. Because not only has he earned our loyalty... Not only does he deserve our loyalty, but it truly is the the best place for us to be. It is the best way for us to be righteous and holy because he wants to be here with us. So let's, 
uh, as we go into our week this week, let's show him that loyalty and let's show him that gratitude that he deserves and that thankfulness that he deserves for what he's done for us. Because, you know, far better it is that we are the one, the place where he is, that we are made righteous and holy so that he could be here with us than that we are outside of him, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for just what he's done for us and the way he's blessed us with his presence. So let's pray. Now, Father God, thank you so much for all you did for us in bringing your son to die for us and to cleanse us and to make us fit to have you come and dwell in us. Lord, it is an amazing and frightful thought that in your holiness, in your awesome holiness, you choose to dwell in us, Lord. I just pray that we never take this fact for granted. I pray that we always treasure this truth and uh, never seek to uh, use it for our own gain or for our own means, but simply, uh, but simply just allow it to overwhelm us with the sense of just how much you love us, Lord, and how much you uh, care for us, that you would come and you would die for us, experience the death that we should have experienced, and experience the brokenness that we should have experienced, all so that we could be close to you, Lord. May we always remember that truth. We ask this in your name. Amen.